Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware, we have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit, but frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to Just Keep Rolling, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Ellen, and I am super anxious to start this episode. I'm Katie, and I'm just super anxious. Aww. So, uh, should we start now, or, or, do yeah, we, do we wait a little bit? No, or, or start now. Are, are you sure? Should yeah. we maybe wait? No, you got this. I, uh, okay, okay. Uh, you know what? Let's just keep rolling into the rolling rehash. Last week we covered chapter twenty-five, the egg and the eye, and the corresponding film scenes. Trouts be damned, the prefects bathe in a luxurious Olympic-sized pool. Artfully depicted mermaids aren't nearly as pervy as Moaning Myrtle. She helps Harry out, but helps herself more to the point where someone should maybe call CPS to save him. Luckily, she is somewhat helpful and he gets his clue, but insults her in the process and chases her off with his lack of tact. Harry's meddling leads to some Chaplin-esque slapstick comedy while Larry, Curly, and Moe play who's on first trying to figure out who broke into Curly's office. Larry blames Peeves, but Moe comes out of nowhere with a bit of misdirection and a save for Harry who was ripe for the catching. In return for the save, Harry loans him the Marauder's map and he does absolutely nothing suspicious at all. Nothing at all. Mm-mm. During episode 95, open a carton of eggs, our Potter pondering was, what are your thoughts about how the movie leaves out the part where Harry sees Bartimius Crouch in Snape's office and nearly gets caught out of bed by Filch and Snape? Hi, it's Max calling from the tub this time. Uh, I think that them leaving out these sort of clues that Mad-Eye Moody isn't Mad-Eye Moody is just their way of sort of prolonging the drama of it a little bit like in the book it's nice and fun to sort of try and figure out what's going on who's the bad guy actually what's going on with harry why do people keep trying to kill him for obvious reasons and in the film it's just a bit better to build the suspense i suppose which is why they throw off weird scenes that don't really make much sense like karkarov putting his name in the goblet of fire even though he wasn't but it's implied that he does so yeah Enjoy that. It's the support badger, so I'm responding to this week's Potter Pondering about leaving Harry seeing Barty Crouch in Snape's office. I really hate that they left that out of the movie, but they did so much other crap where you could tell that it was Barty Crouch Jr. far before you were supposed to. And why would you add all that in? Like, the big thing was like, boom! It's Barty Crouch Jr., but, you know, you leave it out. Whatever. It's fine. It's not fine because lots of people who watch the movies and only the movies, they miss out on big plot points like that that are really important. And you don't ever really find out who Barty Crouch Jr. is, and that bothers me. So all that plays into them leaving him out in that particular scene. But it was supposed to give you, like, suspicion that Mr. Crouch was the person. And you didn't get that opportunity to be like, oh, it's this person. Oh, it's this person. No, it was just like, oh, this weird old guy is here. And uh, he does the same thing as Barty Cross Jr. with his mouth. So that's pretty much it. I mean, that's really frustrating. And I hate that they leave out stuff like that, I guess, for time's sake. But still, I would watch 24 hours of a Harry Potter movie if it got everything in it. But yeah, fuck them for leaving it out. And support Badger out. Hey guys, it's Jackson. So I feel like I'm going to be saying this for pretty much every Potter pondering from now on. Why the hell was this left out? Harry seeing Crouch in Snape's office is important. It is an essential part of the plot. It leads to the whole thing about Moody being Crouch Jr., You know, uh, I can't even talk right because it's pissed me off that much. (laughs) But no, it... (laughs) No! I think that sums it up. But nah, I I hate it. 
I hate that so much of the movie, sorry, of the book has just been left out, especially vital stuff. Thank you to our keepers who called in their responses. We love hearing your voices, and I really hope we get more of these. Right? Also, thank you to those of you that respond on our Facebook page. We love getting to interact with you and read your wonderful thoughts. Our trivia question last week was, when Harry falls asleep in the library the night before the second task, what does he dream the Mer people took from him? In his dream, the mermaid painting in the prefect's bathroom is holding his firebolt just out of his reach. Congratulations goes to Sammy Adams. Woohoo! She's made it up to a five week streak, more than halfway to the record. I think she can do this. Right? She's really amazing. Oh my gosh. But, I mean, we'll see. Someone could come in at any moment. <laughs> it could happen. Yep. For now, let's just keep rolling into the first half of Chapter 26, the second task, and the corresponding film scenes. Chapter 26, The Second Task, Part 1 Hermione is indignant to realize that Harry hadn't actually worked out the egg clue, and Harry tells her to keep her voice down, insisting that he had just been fine-tuning it. He's telling her and Ron about what he witnessed the night before as they practice banishing charms in Flitwick's class. Ron is interested to know that Moody searched Snape's office and wonders if he's there to keep an eye on Snape as well as Karkaroff. Harry isn't sure if Dumbledore asked him to, but is sure that is what he's doing. Hermione reminds Ron that they thought Snape was trying to kill Harry before and he'd actually been saving his life. She perfectly banishes her pillow, and Harry looks at her, thinking about how Snape had saved him, but definitely seems to loathe him and never misses an opportunity to take points, dole out punishments, or even suggest that he should be suspended. Hermione continues speaking to point out that Dumbledore isn't stupid. He was right to trust Hagrid and Professor Lupin. She starts to say that he's likely right about Snape, too, even if Snape is a bit something. But before she can finish her thought, Ron supplies the word evil. He wants to know why else Dark Wizard Catchers are searching his office, and Hermione counters, wondering why Mr. Crouch is pretending to be ill. Ron tells her that she just doesn't like Crouch because of Winky, and sends his cushion soaring out the window. Hermione snaps back that he just wants to think Snape is up to something and again sends her cushion to land neatly in the box. Harry just wants to know what Snape did on his first chance to be on his second one and then surprises himself when he's able to send his own pillow flying across the room to land right on top of Hermione's. Following Sirius's instructions of letting him know when something weird happens at Hogwarts, Harry sends him a letter to explain how Mr. Crouch broke into Snape's office and the conversation between Snape and Moody. He then turns his attention to the most urgent problem he's facing, how to survive underwater for an hour for the second task. Ron suggests using the summoning charm again to summon aqua lungs from the nearest muggle town, but Hermione points out that even if Harry could figure out how to work them in the hour time limit, he would likely be disqualified for breaking the International Code of Wizarding Secrecy. She thinks it would be most ideal if he could transfigure himself into a submarine or something, but since they haven't started learning that yet, it could go very wrong. Harry suggests attacking someone in front of Moody, but Hermione doesn't think he'd let him choose what he wanted to be turned into, and says his best chance is some sort of charm. Once again, they end up spending tons of time in the library among the dusty volumes, this time looking for anything that might let a human survive without oxygen. But despite all the lunchtimes, evenings, and weekends spent there, and even asking Professor McGonagall for permission to use the restricted section, and for Madame Pince's help, they still don't find anything. Harry is beginning to panic and starting to have trouble focusing in class again. Time is slipping away just as it did before he faced the dragon, and as the last week passes by, he's even starting to go off food again. With two days left to go, the only good thing about breakfast is a reply from Sirius asking him to send the date of the next Hogsmeade weekend. Hermione whispers that it's the weekend after next, 
and he scribbles the date on the back of Sirius's note and sends the owl back out. His happiness from seeing the owl starts to fade as he realizes he completely forgot to mention the egg's clue to his godfather. Ron asks why he wants to know about Hogsmeade, and Harry responds that he doesn't know and says it's time for care of magical creatures. Hagrid has been continuing Professor Grubblyplank's lessons on unicorns since he returned to work and has two unicorn foals. They are pure gold, and the sight of them sends Parvati and Lavender into transports of delight. Even Pansy Parkinson has to work to conceal how much she likes them. He tells the class that they're easier to spot than the adults, will turn silver when they're about two, and go pure white when they're about seven. They're also more trusting as babies and don't mind boys so much. So the whole class gets to move in to pat them and give them sugar lumps. While the others swarm the baby unicorns, Hagrid asks Harry if he's okay, figuring he's just nervous. He tells him that he knows he can do anything he sets his mind to. Harry is tempted to confess that he has no idea how to survive at the bottom of the lake for an hour, but when Hagrid smiles confidently and insists that Harry is going to win, he doesn't have the heart to contradict him, and he forces a smile back and pretends to be interested in the unicorns. The evening before the second task has Harry feeling as though he's trapped in a nightmare and frets over what he's going to do and how they could have let this happen. He, Hermione, and Ron are all in the library again, desperately trying to find something but not having any luck. Ron thinks that it can't be done and suggests that Harry just stick his head in the water and yell at the mer people to give back whatever they've taken. Hermione insists that there has to be a way of doing it, and while they're discussing some other options, Fred and George show up to tell Ron and Hermione that Professor McGonagall wants them and they are to take them down to her office. Hermione tells Harry to bring as many books as he can back to the common room, and they will meet him there. At 8 o'clock, Madam Pence kicks him out of the library, and he grabs as many books as he can carry and settles down in the Gryffindor common room. Harry continues to search through the books as people gradually head to bed, and by 10 to midnight, he's gone through all of the books, and Ron and Hermione have not returned. At the idea of having to tell the judges he couldn't do the task, he decides to sneak back down to the library under his invisibility cloak. He looks through book after book and eventually falls asleep, dreaming about the mermaid in the prefix bathroom painting, laughing at him and taunting him with his firebolt. She pokes him in the side and Harry says, that hurts, stop poking me. Dobby's voice replies, saying he must poke Harry Potter, he must wake up. And Harry opens his eyes to find himself in the library. Dobby tells him to hurry since the task starts in 10 minutes, and a panicked Harry tells the elf that it's too late, he can't do the task. Dobby insists that he will do the task, explaining that he found what Harry needed and has to go into the lake to find his wheezy. Harry isn't sure what Dobby means at first, then realizes that the people have Ron, the thing Harry will miss most. Even more worried, Harry asks Dobby what he's supposed to do, and the little elf hands him a ball of something slimy and gray, telling him it's gillyweed and he just needs to eat it right before he goes into the lake. Harry asks if he's sure, and Dobby declares that he's quite sure, because he heard Professor McGonagall and Professor Moody talking about it in the staff room. Harry's doubts disappear, and he jumps up, pulls off the cloak, grabs the gillyweed, and runs out of the library. Dobby wishes him luck as he heads back to the kitchens, and Harry thanks him as he sprints through the corridor, down the stairs, and out onto the grounds, sending Colin and Dennis Creevy flying as he passes. He makes it to the judges, sitting at a gold-draped table at the water's edge, and receives a very bossy, Where Have You Been?, from Percy, who is sitting in for Crouch again. Ludo Bagman tells Percy to let him catch his breath, and Harry bends over, resting his hands on his knees to do so. Just before he starts announcing, Bagman whispers to Harry to make sure he's all right and ask if he knows what he's going to do. Harry says yeah as he massages his ribs, and Bagman points his wand at his throat and says sonorous. Bagman announces that on his whistle, the champions will have precisely an hour to recover what was taken from them. He counts to three, blows the whistle, and the crowd erupts with cheers and applause. Without looking at the other champions, Harry removes his shoes and socks, stuffs the gillyweed into his mouth, and walks into the lake. 
By the time he swallows, he's waist deep and knows he must look stupid as he can hear laughter and jeers coming from the Slytherins. Then, he suddenly feels like an invisible pillow has been pressed over his mouth and nose and a piercing pain on either side of his neck. Realizing that he now has gills, he does the only thing that makes sense and dives into the water. He can breathe and the water feels pleasant instead of chilly. His hands have become webbed, and when he looks at his feet, he sees that they resemble flippers, which he uses to propel himself further into the lake. He sees some shadows and small fish, but there is no sign of the other champions, the merpeople, or Ron, so he stares ahead, trying to see anything through the green weed stretched ahead of him. Without warning, something grabs his ankle, and he twists to see a small, horned grindolo clutching his leg. He reaches into his robes, pulls out his wand, and is joined by two more Grindelows. He attempts to say Relatio, but instead just creates a large bubble from his mouth and sends what appears to be a jet of boiling water towards the water demons. He pulls his foot from the Grindelow's grip and swims away, sending more jets of boiling water behind him and kicking back as he feels another one grab his leg again. He gets away and still can't see anything, but nearly has a heart attack when Moaning Myrtle shows up and asks how he's getting on. She giggles and points in the direction he should head, saying she won't go with him so she doesn't like them much. He gives her a thumbs up and swims on for what seems like 20 minutes before he can hear the haunting Mer song. The movie section starts out in the library with a shot of Harry sleeping on a book. Ron snoring in the background, and Hermione at the end of the aisle asking Harry to tell her again. Harry lifts his head off the book and half-heartedly recites the first line of the poem as he taps his chin against the book. Come seek us where our voices sound. Hermione walks up the aisle towards the boys and acknowledges that that is obviously the Black Lake. She shakes Ron awake and hands him the golden egg as Harry then says, An hour long you'll have to look. Hermione again calls this obvious, but also points out that it is potentially problematic. A frustrated Harry lifts his chin off the book and sarcastically comments on the phrase potentially problematic, wondering when the last time she held her breath underwater for an hour was. Hermione sits down next to him and puts her hand on his shoulder, reassuring him that the three of them can do this. Ron stands up and supportively walks toward Harry as well. But before he can say anything, Mad-Eye Moody shows up and tells them that Professor McGonagall wants to see them in her office. Hermione stands and Harry starts to as well, but Moody says, Not you, Potter, just Weasley and Granger. Hermione begins to protest, saying that the second task is just hours away, and Moody cuts her off to say exactly and point out that Potter is as well prepared as he can be at this point and could do with a good night's sleep. He tells Ron and Hermione to go, adding on a very firm now, and slightly startled, Ron sets the egg down on a book next to Harry. They walk down the aisle, and Moody starts to follow after them, but hesitates and watches Harry start to clean up all the books they had out. He calls for Longbottom, and Neville appears at the end of the book aisle. Moody directs him to help Potter put his books back, and Neville nods as Moody walks off. Carrying a very thick book, Neville approaches Harry and sets the book down telling him that if he is interested in plants, he'd be better off with Goshok's Guide to Herbology. He excitedly starts to tell Harry about a wizard in Nepal who is growing gravity-resistant trees, but a very stressed-out Harry cuts him off to tell him that he really doesn't care about plants. Unless there's a Tibetan turnip that will allow him to breathe underwater for an hour, then great. A very earnest Neville says that he doesn't know about a turnip, but then suggests using gillyweed. The scene cuts to Fred and George, again accepting bets for the task as all the students head down to the lake for the second task. As they say four go down, but will all four come up, one of the twins bumps into his sister, Ginny, who tells them not to be so mean. She continues walking toward the lake, and the twins return to requesting bets. The scene shifts to a close-up on two torsos, as Harry's voice asks Neville if he's sure about this. Neville passes Harry a handful of something green and slimy as he tells him, absolutely. Harry wants to be sure it will last for an hour, and Neville responds, most likely, which doesn't really reassure him. Neville rattles off something about the debate between the effects of fresh water versus salt water, 
and Harry can't believe he's telling him this now. Neville says that he just wanted to help, and Harry acknowledges that he's better than Ron and Hermione, because he has no idea where they are. Neville tells Harry that he seems a little tense, and Harry gives a very sarcastic, Do I? The camera cuts to a wide shot of three multi-tiered viewing platforms built into the lake, and some small boats on the water around them as well. The camera zooms in and rotates around them to a front view, as Dumbledore's voice welcomes everyone to the second task. He explains that last night, a treasure of sorts was stolen from each of the champions, and they now lie on the bottom of the Black Lake. In order to win, each champion only needs to find their treasure and return to the surface. As he continues explaining the rules, saying that they will have one hour to complete the task, the camera shows the four champions getting ready. Harry pulls out the gillyweed, and Moody mutters to him to put it in his mouth. Harry does so and struggles to swallow it causing Moody to smack him on the back a couple of times. As Dumbledore says they may begin at the start of the cannon, it again blasts off immediately and startles everyone. They get over the initial shock and look down as Cedric, Victor, and Fleur all dive into the water, and a struggling Harry is pushed in by Mad-Eye Moody. The view is switched to underwater as Harry writhes in apparent pain as he swims deeper beneath the surface. He rotates upright and clutches at his neck. It breaks out with gills, and he looks down at his feet as they transition into flippers. He holds up his hands as they also become webbed, and then the scene cuts back to the surface where Seamus and Dean are trying to figure out what's the matter with him, and Neville turns his back to the lake, convinced that he's killed Harry Potter. Cutting back to underwater, Harry swims upward and flies out of the water, performing a flip behind Neville's back as Seamus and Dean laugh and cheer. Neville turns back around, wondering what he just missed, and the camera cuts back to beneath the lake, where Harry is rapidly swimming through the weeds and down to the depths amongst the fish. So, I mean, some missing stuff. Yeah. But mostly it's just how things came about really changed. Mm Mm-hmm. The book starts out with Hermione scolding Harry when she finds out that Harry hasn't actually worked out the egg clue like he said he did because for some reason she believed him. Why would she do that? That's just silly. I mean, she did. We talked about it a couple weeks ago. I know. It was silly then. It's silly now. He tells her, keep your voice down. I was just fine tuning it. (laughs) Which is totally code for, I was just doing it. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) They're practicing banishing charms in the back of Professor Flitwick's class, and he's just trying to tell them about what he had witnessed last night between Snape and Moody. Not get nagged at for lying. Well, then you just shouldn't hang around Hermione now, should you? Right? (laughs) Especially not if you're going to lie. Just saying. Seriously. (laughs) Ron is curious about Moody searching Snape's office and wonder if he's there to keep an eye on Snape along with Karkaroff. Harry says he doesn't know if Dumbledore asked him to, but that's definitely what he's doing. (laughs) I mean, I don't know, but I know, and it's definitely that. (laughs) I don't know, but I know. Mm -hmm. Ron says maybe Moody thinks that Snape was the one who put his name in the Goblet of Fire. And Hermione's like, dude, the last time we thought Snape was trying to kill Harry, he turned out to be saving his life and I nearly set the man on fire. So maybe this time we give him the benefit of the doubt? I mean, that seems like it's coming from a place of logic and we just don't do that here. Yeah. Sorry. But Harry's just like, yeah, but it's really weird that he saved my life because he clearly hates me. (laughs) You can't deny. No. You really like, you can't deny that. Sorry. You just can't. Dude keeps trying to punish me or give me detentions or try and get me suspended. Mm-hmm. Or poisoned in or some poisoned. cases. Yeah. Super fun. Hermione says she doesn't care what Moody says because Dumbledore isn't stupid. He was right about trusting Hagrid and Professor Lupin when nobody else would. So why shouldn't he be right about Snape? Ron suggests that Snape is evil and asks Hermione why he would have so many dark wizard catchers searching his office. I mean, why does anyone need their office searched when they're doing something wrong, right? Or suspected of it. Well, there's that too. Gillyweed. (laughs) (laughs) Hermione fires back. 
Why is Mr. Crouch pretending to be ill? It's odd that he couldn't come to the Yule Ball, but is wandering around the castle in the middle of the night. And Ron's like, you just don't like Mr. Crouch because of what happened with Winky. So Hermione's like, you just want to think Snape's up to something. And Harry's over here like, I just want to know what he did with this first chance if this is his second. I just assume Mr. Crouch wasn't there because he didn't have a date to the Yule Ball. Right? Yeah, he fired Winky. (laughs) <laughs> exactly see sad when that happens yeah per Sirius's request previously in this book about wanting to know about anything odd that happens at the castle harry sends him a letter about crouch breaking into snape's office in the conversation between moody and snape that he overheard after sending the letter by a brown owl harry turns his attention to solving the most pressing problem of breathing underwater for an hour Probably good to work on that riddle for a little bit, maybe. Yeah. Just a thought. Let's not leave this one to the last minute. Mm Mm-hmm. Ron likes the idea of using the summoning charm again because Harry told him about aqua lungs. In the muggle world, he's like, you could summon some from a nearby village. And Hermione's (laughs) just like, like he's going to figure out how to work them within an hour time limit. And even if he could, he'd probably get disqualified for breaking the international code of wizarding secrecy. Because... A muggle is bound to notice aqua lungs flying through the air. I mean, theoretically, rules have already been broken since Harry got into this school, really. So why stop now? Rules, yes. That is a law. Meh, I... It's a gray area. Come on. (laughs) Especially when Harry's involved. Exactly. Exactly. Hermione's ideal solution would be for Harry to transfigure into a submarine or something. But since human transfiguration isn't taught until sixth year, something could go terribly wrong if he messed it up. Harry's just like, yeah, I don't feel like spending the rest of my life with a periscope, so... I mean, that could be cool as hell, though. You could, like, see behind you? Maybe. That'd be fun. Unless it hurt. Then that would suck. Never mind. I take it back. (laughs) (laughs) Harry supposes he could attack somebody in front of Moody, and then the professor might do it for him. True. And this is one of those moments where I'm totally Hermione because she takes this joke completely seriously. And it's just like, yeah, but he probably won't let you choose what you turn into. I don't think that would work. <laughs> and Harry's just like, duh, Hermione. You wouldn't know a joke if it danced naked in front of you wearing Dobby's tea cozy. Well, that's pretty true. <laughs> But logical Hermione says his best chances would be a charm. Mm -hmm. So the trio spend their lunchtimes, evenings, and entire weekends in the library searching for any spell that could make Harry breathe underwater. Harry even got a note from Professor McGonagall for permission to use the restricted section. Well, damn. Yeah. And they even asked Madame Pince for help. Whoa. And that's, she's pretty ornery. So that is like brave facing a dragon type situation. (laughs) But still, they could not find anything to help. So that sucks. That's just like, you know that there's got to be something out there and you just can't find it. Well, there'd have to be something because they set the task. Yeah. A familiar panic sets in on Harry and he's now losing his focus in classes again. The lake, which he'd only seen as part of the grounds before, is now this, like, huge, ominous thing. Like, oh god, oh god, oh god. Yeah. He feels like someone has sped up time, and the week before the task just slips away as quickly as it had before he faced the Hungarian horntail. Well, you know what they say, time is like toilet paper. The closer you are to the end, the faster it goes. I have not heard that. (laughs) That's a new one to me. There you go. But two days before the next task, Harry receives a reply from Sirius, but all it says is requesting the date of the next Hogsmeade weekend. Hermione tells Harry that it's the weekend after next and gives him her quill, so he just uses the owl to send a reply back right away. And as he watches the owl fly away, it clicks for him that he never even told Sirius what the egg clue was. So this owl shows up with its godfather's response, and he's just like, oh, thank God. And then he's just like, oh, shit. (laughs) I shot myself in the butt. I shouldn't have had my wand in my back pocket. I blew off my buttock. That's how that felt to him right then. It did, yeah. Better wizards than him have blown off a buttock. Yep. 
Ron asks why he would want to know the Hogsmeade weekend. And Harry's just like, I don't know, but we have to get to care of magical creatures class. Why would he ever want to know the next Hogsmeade weekend? He couldn't be planning to, I don't know, show up in Hogsmeade that weekend. To be fair, I think they are all sleep deprived and very distracted. Wait, what? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So it's possible that Hagrid's making up for blast-ended scroots, or maybe he's just trying to prove he can do anything Professor Grubblyplank can. Anything mm -hmm. Grubblyplank can just... do, I can do better. I was just thinking that. <laughs> I can do anything better than Grubblyplank. No, you can't. Yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, he continues the lessons on unicorns. He seems to know a great deal about them. And even manages to catch two unicorn foals, which are pure gold. And I'm surprised that Harry didn't, like, jump on them right away. Didn't just niffler that shit? A little bit, little bit distracted. <laughs> Lavender and Parvati are completely delighted by them. And even Pansy Parkinson's just like, I can't let people know how much I love these things. <laughs> They're so beautiful. Must stay Slytherin, must not enjoy pretty unicorns. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I feel that. Hagrid tells the class that they're easier to spot than adults, that when they're two, they'll turn silver, and they start growing their horns around four and turn pure white when they're fully grown at about seven. Hmm. He also says that foals are much more trusting and don't mind boys and hands out some sugar lumps for the students to give them. Yeah, suck it, grubbly plank. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the others swarm the baby unicorns because baby unicorns. I mean, yeah. And Hagrid pulls Harry aside to ask if he's okay. He suggests that Harry's just nervous and Harry agrees. Hagrid claps him on the back and tells him that he isn't worried about him after he saw him take on the horn tail and that he can do anything he sets his mind to. Oh, fungal Hagrid. He's such a cheerleader. He's so supportive. I love him so much. Harry tells Hagrid that he's worked out what the clue means and is overcome by the urge to tell him that he has no idea how he's going to survive. Hagrid tells Harry that he knows he's going to win, that he can feel it. Harry doesn't want to ruin Hagrid's mood, so he puts on a smile and pretends to be interested in the baby unicorns. Yeah, pretends. Pretends, right? Come on. Dude was totally interested in the baby unicorns. It's gold. It's gold. It's gold. Must seeker it. Must <laughs> <laughs> must seek it? Nope, I'm going with must seek it. <laughs> must seek it. All right. Harry feels as though he's trapped in a nightmare by the evening before the second task. He berates himself for not working on the clue sooner. I mean, Hermione said. She did. I have to agree. She did I say. I love how in this section of the book, I am Hermione and you are Harry. <laughs> Yeah, fact. Mm -hmm. But anyway, he finds himself wondering how he let this happen. Do that every week. Yeah, I'm telling you, and this is you. Wow. He, Ron, and Hermione are back in the library, frantically looking for a spell and still finding nothing. This is basically where the movie section starts. So skip the unicorn sadness. Right, I would have loved to see a unicorn. Especially a baby. A gold unicorn. A little baby unicorn. It's a little cute. Your boy, your boy, your boy, your boy, your unicorn. Wow. <laughs> that happened. It did. Anyway. Moving on. Everyone is assuming their usual positions in the library. Hermione asking the questions that need answers. Harry going along with her just enough to not get yelled at. And Ron sleeping. Yeah. Of course. You are totally Harry and Ron combined. I am, <laughs> especially today. <laughs> Katie fell asleep while we were recording. I did. But my microphone was so comfy to rest my head upon. Apparently. Yeah, it's been a long week. Anywho, moving on. Hermione then instructs Harry to tell her again, and he begins to repeat the mermaid song from the egg, never completely lifting his head off of the book that he was half-heartedly searching in. I actually love this simple little physical depiction of the frustration. The way mm -hmm. he like beats his head against his like chin. 
chin with every yeah. single word that he says he just bangs his chin back on the book i was like mm-hmm. oh he's so frustrated it really gives you that feel that they've been at this forever even though we didn't hear about it ellen i'm harry in this scene i know <laughs> i said so <sighs> after harry recites the first line come seek us where our voices sound Hermione walks up the aisle towards them and acknowledges that this is obviously the Black Lake. Obviously. Obviously. She takes a moment to tell Ron to get the fuck up and tosses the golden egg over to him so he can at least, you know, I don't know, pretend to be helpful or something. Maybe. Look like you're busy, guy. Just come on. Do something, damn it. (laughs) Harry continues on saying an hour long you'll have to look. Hermione acknowledges that this is also obvious, but points out that there might be an issue with it. You know, just one or two. Smidge. Maybe. No baby issue. Sassy Harry looks at Hermione incredulously and asks, what the fuck do you mean, might? Do you know how to hold your breath for an hour? Do you know how to breathe underwater? Does your ass know how to become a goddamn fish? No, I didn't think so. Harry might have gotten a little worked up in my head. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Hermione then becomes desperate to be positive and tells Harry that they can do this. She believes in them. We got this, yo. They'll figure something out. Last minute rally. Right? Harry seems a little less than convinced, though. So, I mean... According to the book, it has been weeks and weeks and weeks of them trying to figure this out to no avail. So, yeah, this actually kind of mirrors the attitude in the book where Ron is like, I don't think it can be done. Your best chance is to put your head in the lake and yell at the mer people to give back whatever they nicked. (laughs) I mean, it's a more solid plan that they have at this point. So that is very true. For all we know, mermaids have super good hearing and they'd be able to hear that. And they're cool with just giving shit back. Maybe. Maybe. Hermione crossly says that there has to be a way. And Harry says that he should have learned how to be an animagist like Sirius. While they're discussing this, Fred and George come to tell Ron and Hermione that McGonagall sent for them and they're supposed to take them to her office. Side note. Even if Harry had become an animagus, what if he was, like, one that doesn't swim? Right, since they don't actually get to choose what they become. (laughs) Yeah. That could have really failed for you. Yeah. It is entirely possible that he doesn't know you don't get to choose. True. So. Very true. Meanwhile, movie Ron is less pessimistic and gets up in an attempt to look supportive. Although, like, what the fuck is he really going to do? Not a lot. No. No. But you know what? He looked supportive. He did. He looked very sympathetic. Mm Mm-hmm. Before Mad-Eye Moody, not Fred and George, interrupts them and tells Ron and Hermione to piss off because Potter has shit to think about and eggs to crack. Oh, yeah. And McGonagall wants to see them, too. Which, like you said, Mad-Eye Moody, not Fred and George. Mm Mm-hmm. But the end result is the same. They have to go to McGonagall's office. Yeah. Don't shoot the messenger for not being the same one. Right. You know? Harry begins to get up as well, but Moody tells him to sit his little ass back down because McGonagall doesn't want your sassy ass. You must continue this journey on your own. Hermione begins to protest again since it's really just who she is as a person at this point. Saying that the second task is only hours away and Harry won't know which foot goes in front of the other without her there to tell him. Mm Mm-hmm. To be fair, that tracks. I mean, she literally kept telling him, solve the egg, solve the egg, solve the egg. Harry didn't solve the egg. And now here they are fucked. That was quite succinct. Very well done. <laughs> <laughs> the Cliff's Notes version. Yes. <laughs> of the whole series. <laughs> <laughs> Moody cuts her off to say that this is exactly the point. And it's time to kick the bird out of the nest since that boy is just about as prepared as he's ever going to be. And he should go get some shut-eye. In the book, Hermione doesn't protest. Just says they'll meet him back in the common room and for him to bring as many books as he can with him. That doesn't happen in the movie. Like, not at all. 
In the movie, Moody starts to follow after Ron and Hermione, but stops before he leaves to tell Neville to show off those crazy reading skills by helping Harry put his stuff away. Neville makes his way over to Harry and notices he's looking at some herbology books. So he nerds the fuck out <laughs> and starts talking about other nerdy wizards who are trying to invent gravity resistant trees. But for the life of me, I'm not sure why you would want your tree to resist gravity. But I mean, I guess this is why I'm not a plant nerd. I'm with you. Yeah. I don't know, maybe because they're rooted in the ground, it would just be like the branches going upwards, like dirigible plums, maybe? I don't know. But why? If if it's resisting gravity, can I pull it down? I, I don't like it, but whatever. Yeah. I don't want my trees to float. That's all I'm saying. Harry, like me, is also not a plant nerd, but is way too stressed to be nice about it. <laughs> And he basically just tells Neville that if he knows of a plant that'll help him stay alive today, then cool. Otherwise, he has zero time and less than zero patience for his nerdy bullshit. Neville, you're doing it again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is when Neville brings up Gillyweed. Take that, Harry. Look at that. Useful. Although this severely condenses and changes the way the book had it. Not just condenses, it also changes? Yeah. What? Harry's kicked out of the library at 8 o'clock and returns to the Gryffindor common room with all of the books that he can carry and continues searching. By 10 to midnight, the common room is empty and he was out of books. There is also no sign of Ron and Hermione. Hmm. So it's like almost midnight. He's sitting there like, I have no idea what the fuck I'm doing. Where are my friends? I can't handle this. This is all over. But he's like, oh, my God. I can't go tell the judges that I can't do the task. That's Friend. awful. So he grabs his invisibility cloak and just sneaks back into the library. I'm not saying that was the wrong option, but if it's me, I'm sneaking back into that prefect's bathroom and having another <laughs> bath. <laughs> if it's my last one, I'm going to make it a good one. But he definitely wasn't going to be able to sleep. So that was probably the one thing that was going to help him fall asleep because that's what happened. He searched through books for hours and ends up falling asleep. What? And while he's sleeping, he has this dream that the mermaid from the painting in the prefix bathroom is taunting him with his firebolt. Like, come and get it. Come and get it. Which was our trivia question. Yep. And she, like, pokes him in the side with the broomstick. And he's like, stop poking me. That hurts. <laughs> and then Dobby's like, no, I have to poke you because... You have to wake you up. You have to wake up. <laughs> Harry Potter must wake up. And when he opens his eyes, Dobby is there in the library. And he's just like, the task is in 10 minutes, dude. You got to get up. Oh, my God. And Harry again has that, it's too late. I can't do the task moment. <laughs> and Dobby's just like, you will do the task because Dobby solved the problem for you. <laughs> and he says that he must go into the lake to get his wheezy. His wheezy. His wheezy. His wheezy. And Harry's like, what the fuck's a wheezy? <laughs> and it's just like, wheezy who has given Dobby his sweater. And a Harry's Weasley. just like, shit, they got Ron. <laughs> Which is very alarming to him because here he is dreaming that they took his firebolt, the thing that he'd miss most, only to find out it's actually his best friend. Right. The thing he would actually miss most. Yeah. He didn't stop to consider the fact that it wouldn't be an object. Right. A person, not a thing. Mm-hmm. They did say they've taken what you'd sorely miss, not who you'd sorely miss. So, but misdirection. I mean, yeah, they're trying to trip you up. <laughs> and they did. And they did, and it fucking worked. But Harry is very alarmed, and he asks Dobby what he has to do. And Dobby just hands him a slimy gray-green ball and says, you just have to eat it. That makes me think of when someone's like, oh, my God, this smells terrible. Here, smell it. Right. Like, He's like, here, go eat this right before you get in the water. <laughs> and Harry's just like, are you sure? <laughs> that seems suspicious. It's not that I don't trust you, Dobby. It's just you've had a way of your plans to save me backfiring right. massively in the past. It's not that I don't trust you. It's that I know you. <laughs> it's not that I don't trust you. It's just I don't trust you, <laughs> exactly. basically. 
(laughs) (laughs) But Dobby tells him that he overheard Professor McGonagall and Professor Moody talking about the task. And Professor Moody wondered if Potter would think to use Gillyweed. Oh. So Harry's just like, okay, this is the thing. I can do this. And he just like grabs everything and stuffs them in his bag and rushes out of the library with the Gillyweed. Sure. Dobby wishes him good luck, and Harry thanks him before sprinting across the grounds to the other side of the lake. He reaches the judges, and Percy's disapproving voice asks him where he's been. And Percy's there because he's again filling in for Mr. Crouch. Where have you been? With your mom, Weasley. Where have you been? <laughs> That's what I think of when I get Shut to up, part. Weatherby. <laughs> right? <laughs> Mr. Bagman's just like, let Harry catch his breath. He's looking super relieved that Harry made it. Mm-hmm. Fishy. He's his favorite. There's nothing weird about that at all. He's taken a liking to him. A wink, wink. But Harry doesn't have enough time to get rid of the stitch in his side and just continues panting. <laughs> it was a rough run. That's a lot of ground to cover. Hella cardio, once again. Yeah. <laughs> and also, again, completely completely different from the movie (laughs) just oh my god so different so different so different once neville not dobby brings up gillyweed the scene cuts to fred and george once again being the ringmaster slash bookies of the quad wizard tournament accepting all bets for the task as everyone makes their way down to the lake to watch it as they shout four go down but we'll all four come up one of the twins george George, Fred. Fred. Anyway, one of the twins bumps into Ginny, who turns and admonishes them both for being mean. But I mean, come on, really? Have you met them? The sensationalism is pretty on brand. Yeah. Just saying. It's a thing. Mm Mm-hmm. The scene shifts to a drug deal of slimy green seaweed-looking shit as Harry's voice asks Neville if he's sure about this. Neville passes it to Harry and says, all the cool kids are doing it, bro. Because, <laughs> you know, Neville knows what all the cool kids do. Yeah. Yeah. He knows, he just doesn't do it with them. There is that. So, that's a thing. <laughs> Harry wants to be sure it will last for an hour, and Neville responds, eh, it depends on your tolerance level, really. Yeah. And then he rattles off some nerd talk about the debate between the effects of fresh water versus salt water, And Harry says, you know, this is something that could have been brought to my attention yesterday. Neville says that he was just trying to help. Because he was. He was. He did. And Harry's like, well, I mean, at least you're better than those bastard no-shows Ron and Hermione. Where the fuck are they anyway? Because there's no Dobby to tell him about his wheezy. Right. (laughs) Neville just tells Harry to take his gillyweed to calm down because he seems tense. And sassy Harry quips back with, do I? (laughs) Do I really? So Harry's entrance into the quad wizard tournament is vastly different from the book to the movie. Oh, a little bit. Yeah. Because in the book, he's like panicking, sprinting down there. Mm -hmm. And in the movie, he's having this casual stroll with Neville and he's just like walking in with all the plebs. Yeah. Like, you'd think that the champions would have to turn up early or something. You would think. But no, it's different. Well, plus, too, in the movie, he finds out about Gillyweed the night before. Whereas in the book, Dobby's just telling him about it 10 minutes before it's time to go down there. He does not have any time. It is all a panic blur. And I think that that's more exciting. Oh, yeah, I agree. Plus, we would have gotten to see Dobby. Right? Dobby. I'm super bummed. I mean, at least it's a nod to the book because in the book, Neville did know that information and that was kind of the whole setup. It just Mm -hmm. didn't work out that way because Harry's super prideful. Of course. And we will end up talking a little bit more about that in a future episode, but at least it ties into that. But I would have loved to see Dobby again. He's Dobby. Yeah. And I really wanted to hear him say, you have to go get your wheezy, your wheezy. (laughs) Oh, little Dobby with his big old eyes. I love him. Yeah, the setup of the tournament is vastly different from the book to the movie. Like, so different. Mm -hmm. Because the latter has an overly elaborate spectator setup built into the lake that 
did not exist in the book at all. Not even remotely. And let's be honest, was really nonsensical. It just seemed expensive. Just ridiculous. You could have put that towards something else in the budget. Like plot. <laughs> like background checks for teachers. <laughs> <laughs> But the camera zooms in and rotates around them to a front view as Dumbledore's magnified voice welcomes everyone back to the Quad Wizard Tournament, where everything is made up and the points don't matter. (laughs) (laughs) He then tells everyone that something was stolen from each of the champions and was taken to the bottom of the Black Lake. Sounds so ominous. It does! It sounds like something that should not be on school grounds. They don't call it the Black Lake in the book. The Great Lake. Yeah. In the book, so... And that does not sound anywhere near as ominous as the Black Lake. Right? That just makes it sound like a dark, creepy place. It does, and it's right by the Forbidden Forest. Like, something tells me that city planners were not involved in the placing of this school. That's all I'm saying. I'm just saying, if you don't want kids to go in the forest, (laughs) do not name it the Forbidden Forest. There's that. Definitely. If you don't want kids to, you know, drown in a lake, don't call it the Black Lake. Yeah. That just sounds like something out, like the creature from the Black Lagoon. Like, mm-hmm. this is a horror story waiting to happen. Definitely. And then they think it's a good idea to have a quad wizard tournament challenge under the Black Lake. Yeah. Where they put all the spectators in the middle of the Black Lake. With boats. With little ass boats. We're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's get back to what they have to do to win. Well, are you ready for this? It's really great. All they have to do to win is swim to the bottom of the lake, which is fucking huge, not get killed by lake creatures in the dark, find the mystery thing that is hopefully not the grain of rice with your name written on it that you got at the mall, and then swim back to the surface with your mystery thing, which, for all you know, could be one of your prized anvils from your anvil collection. Easy peasy lemon squeezy, right guys? Easy. Super easy. I did it while you were going through that sentence. Right. I'm done. It was Twice. so easy. <laughs> this, of course, again has Dumbledore doing the announcing, since Bagman was not included in the films. Boo. Boo. In the book, Bagman moves Harry away from Crumb and asks if he's okay and to see if he knows what he's going to do because he's still taking a liking to him. (laughs) Still rooting for you, Harry. Harry's just like, yeah, I got this. Although he's also still massaging his ribs from his run. (laughs) And then Bagman points his wand at his throat and announces that the champions have exactly one hour to recover what's taken from them. And then he counts to three. And blows his whistle and everybody cheers and applauds. Sure. That's what I do whenever I hear a whistle. And I thought it was really interesting because in the movie, they actually had them all like wearing swimming gear. Mm -hmm. And Harry shows up to this. And it could be just because he's in the library that he was not prepared at all. But he still shows up to this fully in his robes and everything. Yeah. And he bothers to stop and take off his socks and shoes. Well, I mean, he can't swim in shoes. That's but, like, just... keeps his big-ass robes on? He's not a genius, Ellen. He's not a genius. <laughs> Harry was not put in Ravenclaw he's... for a reason. He's not a claw. That's for damn sure. But he then stuffs the gillyweed in his mouth and just wades out into the lake. And he's about waist-high, standing there chewing. And he can hear jeers coming from the Slytherin section. And he's just like, I look like a fucking idiot right now (laughs) it's freezing this isn't gonna work i don't know what i'm doing fuck me that's not quite how it goes in the movie there are some slight differences one or two or all 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 of them them. (laughs) (laughs) while dumbledore drones on about rules and all the other champions get themselves psyched up to definitely develop hypothermia and whatnot harry pulls out the gillyweed And Moody mutters to him to put it in his mouth. Wait, what? That sounds so dirty. I know. Ugh. Just keep rolling. So Harry does so and struggles to swallow it. What the fuck? I know. Just keep rolling. Uh, Causing Moody to smack him on the back a couple of times. (laughs) That's dirty. Hey, that's my line. (laughs) If you can't beat him, join him. If you can't deny it, supply it. (laughs) (laughs) 
This, of course, is not how it happened in the book, since Harry ate the gillyweed without inappropriate prompting from Moody. Everybody loves some inappropriate prompting. Well, I know what you do on your Saturday night. <laughs> All of a sudden, it feels as though he's being suffocated by an invisible pillow, and he's got these piercing pains on both sides of his neck, and he's just like, fuck, I have gills. <laughs> and he does the only logical thing, which is fling himself into the water. He also isn't standing in the freezing water. Since they had the super fancy, completely unnecessary platforms mid-lake instead of everyone just watching from the bank. Mm -hmm. Plus, as Dumbledore says, they may begin at the start of the cannon, not whistle. It again blasts off immediately and startles everyone. Don't worry, Filch, I hear it happens to all guys. His cannonballs sure do have a problem with premature evacuation, don't they? Premature evacuation. <laughs> They get over the initial shock and look down as Cedric, Victor, and Fleur all dive in the water, followed by a struggling Harry who needed a bit of a shove from Mad-Eye Moody. It was an inappropriate prompting. Forced prompting. <laughs> Forced prompting. Oh, dear. <laughs> in the book, his first breath underwater feels like a breath of life. And he notices the water now feels very cool and light. His hands are webbed and his feet are like flippers and he can see very clearly and no longer needs to blink. Okay, that'd be kind of cool. Right? Yeah. The movie also has a similar setup, because we then see underwater. What we watch is Harry wriggles in a panic as he swims downwards, then twists upright and grabs his neck and feels the gills forming. Yeah, and in the book, they actually formed while he was still above water, so he was calmer when he actually dove in. Yeah. He calms down pretty quickly, though. He looks down at his newly flippered feet and examines his webbed fingers before the scene then returns to the surface where Seamus and Dean are trying to figure out what's the matter with him. Giving our one line wonder a second line. I don't know. I can't see him. <sighs> he better get used to that view though because they are going to spend a whole fucking hour staring at the surface of that lake. Yeah, that had to be a really boring task to watch. <laughs> I'm actually kind of bummed that we can't call Dean our one-line wonder anymore. He's our two-line tutor. No. Yeah, no. That was a nice try, but no. I got nothing else. <laughs> Very obviously. Anyway, Hogwarts push a man Neville turns his back to the lake, scared that he's killed Harry Potter. Because, you know, Voldemort couldn't do it, but maybe drugs can. Maybe. Who knew? Cutting back to underwater, Harry swims upward, and like they used to say on sugarcool.net, he shot out of the water like a cannon, but not at all like cannon. Because that's not how it happened in the book. Uh, uh, not at all. <laughs> he does a flip that Neville completely misses as Seamus and Dean laugh and cheer, though Karkaroff gives it a negative too. <laughs> yeah, well. That darn Bulgarian judge is always so tough. Neville spins around, aware he just missed something, and the camera cuts back to beneath the lake, where Harry is hauling fins to find his filched fortune. Very nice. Thank you. And this is where we cut the movie scene to end for this week. In the book, it keeps going just a bit more. Alrighty. We had control over this halfway cut, so it lines up fairly well. Mm -hmm. But he dives into the depths, passing black weeds, glimmering stones, and some fish but no other creatures are champions. He's trying to see shapes in the gloom when a Grindelow grabs him by the ankle. <gasps> he fumbles for his wand and two more Grindelow grab his robes, trying to pull him down. He tries to shout Relatio, but there's a bubble instead of sound from his mouth and boiling water instead of sparks from his wand. We see more of the Grindelow later, but not just yet. So we'll talk about that then. Mm. Harry manages to pull free from the Grindelows and swims away. After a moment, he slows and puts his wand back, looking and listening again. Moaning Myrtle appears to ask how Harry is getting on and nearly gives him a heart attack. I'm kind of glad they didn't put this in the movie. <laughs> I've had enough of Myrtle. Only because of the way they did movie Myrtle. Well, yeah. Had they not made her so molesty, then maybe Moaning Myrtle in this scene would have been tolerable. Maybe. Because in this scene, she just giggles at the bubble that comes out of his mouth when he tries to yell at her. And she points him in the direction he needs to go. And she says she won't come with him, though, because she doesn't like them. 
Like, it's not creepy. If they would have done that for the movie, sure. Yeah. But the way she was already characterized, I feel like they would have done something creepy with her. Yeah. And I'm not here for that. Yeah. Harry thanks her with a thumbs up and swims off. What feels like 20 minutes later, he hears a snatch of the haunting Mer song. And this is where we cut the book chapter. Boom. Look at that. And since we don't have any new actors to talk about in this section of the movie, we're going to go right on to our Potter pondering. Which is, did you prefer Dobby or Neville helping Harry acquire Gillyweed, and why? Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts, or call us at 216-526-6792 and leave your response as a voicemail. Make sure you start off telling us your name and then go into your answer, and there's a good chance that your response could end up in our next episode. Mm-hmm. We really look forward to reading and hearing them. This will bring us to our Sorting Hat story, which is from Loris Ophill. She writes, I'm a Slytherin. My wand is ebony wood with a dragon heartstring core, 12 and 3 quarters inches, and rigid flexibility. My Patronus is a hyena. The very first time I came across the Harry Potter books was by accident. I was in the hospital having open heart surgery, and I was having a hard time recovering and had already been there for over a month. I had become withdrawn and silent. One day a volunteer who had a book cart came to my room, and I sat in my chair looking out the window, refusing to even speak with them. He could tell how sad I was, and said that he was going to leave me a book on my bed that would hopefully send me on a great adventure. After he left, I got up and picked up a very loved paperback copy of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. I've been on every great Harry Potter adventure since then. That volunteer gave me my Hogwarts letter that day, and I will always be eternally grateful to him. That's really cute. Oh my god, I'm not crying. You're crying. I'm crying. That was really, really sweet. That is an amazing story. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Loris. Definitely, thank you. And if any of you other keepers out there listening would like us to read your Sorting Hat story on a future episode, you can email it to us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com. Let us know your house, wand, Patronus, how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else you might want to share with us. Or you can message it to us over social media. You can indeed. This week's trivia question is, how many points do each champion receive for the second task? The first person who responds with a correct answer in the code word, hashtag moral fiber, will get a sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes or Facebook. Make sure to email us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com to let us know you did, and we will get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook at JKR Podcast and Twitter and Instagram at Just Keep Rolling. Following us on Podbean at justkeeprolling.podbean.com will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. Make sure to check out our website at justkeeprolling.com and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you would like to help us continue creating more content, you can support us as a patron and get extra perks on patreon.com slash justkeeprolling. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated. But speaking of patrons, we do want to welcome our newest patron and our first Order of Merlin third class patron. Yay! Callie Waters. Woohoo! I love Callie. I love her so much, but I'm biased because she's actually my nephew's girlfriend. So, yay. <laughs> well, she's not my nephew's girlfriend, no. and I love her too. She is adorable. You can't not love her. <laughs> <laughs> She got a taste of the patron life when she hung out with us and some of our other patrons for a trivia thing that we did. It was actually like a trivia girls weekend patron yeah. event thing. Sorry, boy patrons. We love you, too. It just my husband was out of town and I needed the girls. Right. And I mean, they weren't there. That's just how it goes. But we will do one with boys as well sometime. But yeah, she didn't go running and screaming into the night. So I don't think we scared her. Yay. No, she seemed to have such a good time that she decided to join us as a patron. And I think other people should do that, too. It's an excellent right? idea. I'm all for it. Welcome, Callie. We're really glad to have you as part of the patron family. Yep. And join us next week when we talk about the second half of Chapter 26, the second task, and the corresponding film scenes. 
Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. Until the next time, just, just keep, keep rolling. rolling.